Hi. <laughs> Joke's on you. I can't hear out of the seer, so I didn't hear any of you. <laughs> um, I'm going to get started. Um, I flew into uh, Nashville last night. I have never been at anything like DrupalCon before, or to be honest, anything like Nashville before. Um, this is like the biggest conference easily that I've ever spoken at. Uh, again, because I can't hear, just tell me to get closer to the mic if I need to. Um, I, uh, I admit that I spent way too long trying to figure out what a Dries note was last week. <laughs> like I got this email from some dude, doesn't have a last name, and I don't know, you probably all got, I mean I got 17,000 emails from DrupalCon, let's be honest, so. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, cool, another weird email. And then the developers I work with were like, no, he's like a thing. You should know who that guy is. So um, that's how you kick off your DrupalCon talk. You talk about how you don't know who the guy is who created Drupal. Um, hi, my name is Corey Vilhauer. Um, I work at a place called Blend Interactive in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, we, are, we handle large-scale, content-heavy uh, development implementations, uh, both .NET and uh, on the PHP side. Um, I'm typically there to handle content strategy and the user experience side of things. Often though, I end up helping people figure out what they're supposed to be doing with, uh, with accessibility after the site has already launched. Um, I'm also an avid biker, which is notable because Sioux Falls has been incredibly active in, the, uh, in bike advocacy over the past uh, several years. We've spent a lot of time building, kind of slowly, but we're, we're building up a, a, an infrastructure that can maintain a, a healthy bike community. But, it's not really happening overnight because we like cars. And if, <laughs> and if you think we like cars just as a nation, you should see how much we like cars in the Midwest where all of the cities are 17 hours away from each other and the closest Ikea is like a whole state away. So it brings us to this sort of funny impasse where we are really lucky to be in an age where uh, there's, a, there's a swell of uh, sustainability and, and fitness that really sort of is coalescing around bicycle groups in our community, but some habits are really hard to break. So you end up with bike lanes. Uh, these I pulled these pictures off the internet, but literally there was one of these outside of my hotel when I walked out. I didn't have time to change the slide, so pretend these are all from Nashville because they might as well be. We still struggle understanding that that even the basics of you know bike lanes aren't parking spots or that uh, the things you need to do to make roads better for cars are also the things that you need to do to make roads better for bikes. And I wish this was a thing that uh, we could simply assign to bicycles in existing roadways, but in reality, the separation of intent, of building an infrastructure, and then the actual action, the, the use and education around that infrastructure, it's, it's present wherever any level of, of accessibility is found. You know, we see this when wheelchair ramps are built into a storefront, but upon entering, the aisles are so skinny you can't really get around. We see this when somebody has uh, made a, a big effort to bring uh, some sort of translators or, or, or sign language interpreters in, but they're placed in an area where not everyone can see them. If I dare uh, segue into a conference talk, this is what happens to our websites. You know, we do all we can to make sure that the site is built to pass all of the technical accessibility tests, but we don't give enough thought to how accessibility will be maintained uh, on the editorial side. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about web accessibility, but I'm not going to talk about navigation patterns or, or color contrast. I'm going to talk about the parts of accessibility that we as editors have control over uh, and that we uh, often find gray areas within. Um, Areas where language takes over, where, where checking a box no longer really cuts it, when we have to depend on judgment calls. And the fact is, judgment calls are really scary. I hope after this they won't be as scary. Through this talk, I'll dive into what it means to be an accessible editor. Uh, we'll talk about the scope of what falls under editorial accessibility, you know, the things that we can do. Uh, to provide a more accessible site using uh, the editing tools we hopefully are provided uh, through our CMS. We'll talk about um, the actual structure, the individual fields uh, of a site, but we'll also dive into the art of writing uh, as well. And then finally, uh, we will touch briefly 
on uh, what we can do to promote it within our organizations. Uh, this is ultimately a talk for editors, uh, site managers, for project management. Um, but if you're a web developer in here and you haven't rushed out the door screaming, I hope that it, it will help you get a better idea of the types of things that editors will, will need from, from a Drupal site. So first, uh, let's dive into what we mean when we talk about web accessibility. Uh, on the web, accessibility is uh, the practice of removing barriers for, for people uh, with disabilities. So much like new building construction must uh, provide accessible ent entrances and, and businesses must provide uh, reasonable accommodations to employees with disabilities, websites must be created in a way that allows access to information despite uh, any existing or, or future disability. Sometimes, especially during web uh, presentations like this one, you'll see accessibility uh, written as, as A11Y. This is a, a clever little abbreviation, uh, and I always have to bring it up because we give this talk to, uh, we give this as a workshop to our clients once we've launched a site, and n none of them know what this is. I'm so inside myself, I assume everyone knows what A11Y means. Um, but it's a, it's a clever little uh, abbreviation. It conveys two things. It represents the word accessibility, you know, A and a Y with 11 letters in between, but more importantly, it provides insight into the purpose of accessibility. You know, that we are being an ally to those with, with differing needs, purposely making things better uh, for those, for example, who cannot see, or, or those who uh, are colorblind, or those who are unable to use a mouse. This is, in essence, the idea of inclusive uh, design, uh, accessible design. Um, I don't mean strictly the structure and graphical design of a, of a page or a piece of content. I mean the entire scope of, of how a website is made, from, from designing user interfaces that an editor will use to enter content to the content itself. Because most websites rely on written and visual communication, accessibility issues are, are most often seen as visual issues, uh, affecting those with, with temporary or, or permanent vision problems. Uh, these situations often require things like screen readers, uh, which will you know, read the content to you, depending on how the site is structured. But it also uh, affects those who have motor or uh, mobility disabilities, you know, people who may not be able to use a mouse, uh, who uh, will tab through the page instead of, instead of scrolling through it. Um, it affects those with auditory disabilities, such as deafness or airplane rides, apparently, uh, who require, require captions and, and transcripts of, of, of uh, audio content. And it even encompasses those who have cognitive disabilities or, or language barriers, who just simply cannot understand what might be overwritten page content. And additionally, it's worth noting that not every disability is life-changing. Not every disability is permanent. Uh, I alluded to it earlier, but somebody who is permanently deaf is much different from uh, somebody who has an ear infection, uh, like, like I do. But our websites don't know that. You know, there's an obvious spectrum of disabilities. There's a different, d definite difference between these things, but to a website, all of, a, all of those disabilities are, are ultimately equal. Somebody who can't hear at that point can't hear at that point. And finally, there's one additional gray area uh, in accessibility, and that's the simple need and promise of information and what we can do to provide it in less than optimal conditions. You know, according to the Pew Research Center, just over one in 10 American adults are smartphone only, and just over one in four lives without a broadband internet connection. And for those 65 and over, it's one in two. Additionally, four million people, which doesn't sound like a lot given the grand scheme of, of the nation, but uh, it's roughly the size of the audience that watched the series finale of Parks and Recreation, they classify themselves as immigrants with less than a good grasp of the English language. So. These aren't, image, these aren't issues of whether or not an image has a certain contrast or if a page can be tabbed through. These are issues of needing sites that can load on slow speed connections, sites that uh, can be easily read with an in-browser translator, I know, sites that can conform not just to those who have a visible disability, but those who can't afford the best computers or the fastest connections or are underrepresented in some other way. So how do we make real change happen? I think ultimately it comes down to two almost psychological truths that we have to embrace. First is understanding that the potential audience of a website or app is anyone human. This is a quote by uh, Hayden Pickering in his, in his book, Inclusive Design Patterns. Uh, it's about 50% development, the book is. I have 50% wonderful thoughts on, on the editorial side of, of accessibility. 
it boils down to um, you don't know who might hit your site, so at least make it welcoming when some, that stranger shows up. The second is that websites are made of code, and code is translated by robots. And when I talk about robots, I don't mean actual robots, but I'm talking about the systems that have been created over the past decades to help read and translate code. They are not like real people. They're programs. They don't understand nuance. They don't understand sarcasm. They don't understand anything that might be implied through language or color. So we have to provide that context. And this comes in uh, two forms. It comes in the things that we assign to a page template. You know, this is the stuff that ho hopefully is already baked into to development once an editor receives it. And it makes up what we would call the content model. Um, I like to steal Jeff Eaton's description of a content model because it's a million times better than mine. And it breaks down into three things. A content model is the kinds of things that we make, uh, the, how they are related to each other within the CMS and what bits of information they contain. And in terms of accessibility, uh, this is what we can use to make content that is able to be read by a screen reader. This is how we make content that can be tabbed through uh, using a keyboard. It allows us to assign alternative text. Um, it, it parses into something readable. The other side of that is the blob of stuff that we put inside of the content model. And this is tied to the writing conventions of the web. What we write needs to be just as accessible as the navigation and the design. And this is uh, done through the gray area of writing, through a uh, clear heading structure, through links that are clear, videos that are captioned, but also a bunch of stuff that doesn't really have rules. So uh, let's get started. Section two. My, my wife, when she watched me do this talk, said, you need to be clearer when you switch to a new section. So I made the text orange. <laughs> In this section, we'll talk about how to write and, and uh, when to ignore things that might relate to uh, the things of the, uh, of the content model. Uh, we'll talk about images and alternative text. We'll talk about video and podcast transcriptions. And we'll talk about the title field of our pages. Now, this is typically something that we do as a giant workshop. It's like a whole day thing. Um, so really, this is kind of like the high level view of these things. I also usually talk about PDFs here. But in an effort to save time, I've summed that into two rules. Uh, number one, don't use them. <laughs> and number two, if you have to use them, then at least make sure they're as accessible as an HTML page. All right, next. <coughs> Alternative text ends up being the heavyweight of the uh, accessibility world, uh, especially when it comes to what editors can do because it deals with a major portion uh, of the accessibility audience, those who cannot see, and it deals with a major part of the website, the images. Um, more so, alternative text can be easily tested uh, by browser services like, like Wave. Uh, so it becomes sort of the base level of, am I accessible and what do I need to fix? It gets thrown into being a yes or no answer, which is incredibly frustrating because it, uh, alternative text is anything but a yes or no answer. There are a lot of gray areas within the world of alternative text. The rule to the letter is that um, every non-text element uh, requires a text alternative so that it can be read using assistive services. An example of that, let's look at this page. There are uh, four main areas on this page that require alternative text. There's the site logo, the header image, the social icons, and the products. Because without the images, the content is simply not conveyed. If these were not assigned some kind of alternative text, the social, uh, the, somebody who cannot see this page would have no idea of what is on it outside of the headings. So in essence, what alternative text allows us to do is it provides an alternative to every image that is necessary for understanding the content. We provide text in each of these areas, uh, so as they're encountered, they still convey the same ideas. It's very bright. Uh, in Drupal, alternative text is most often added in one of two places. Uh, first, you can uh, add the alt text to the image itself when it's uploaded. Um, so that would be right there. And then uh, whenever this text is, or whenever this image is added to a template in Drupal, uh, unless it's overridden for some reason, uh, this is the text that will be read by a screen reader. Um, if you're adding something to, to the what you see is what you get, or a WYSIWYG field, you will have the opportunity to add alternative text as well. Right here, it says short description for the visually impaired, and you'll just drop your text in there. Um, you have to confirm that these are in your install, but I don't know why anyone would take them out. 
Uh, and what this actually does is it creates a little snippet of code that screen readers uh, can read. Alt equals something, whatever text you want it to read instead of, instead of the image. That's how you add it, but in order to write it, it's a little bit different. Um, ultimately, it depends on the context. But writing alternative text boils down to this. Alternative text conveys necessary information at a level that someone who can see the image might get. Uh, now we'll get into the idea of information in a bit, but first a few examples. In this case, it's pretty easy. This slide has text in it. So the information we need to convey is the text within that slide. This is long, but we'll get to that. Otherwise, this is pretty obvious. We're going to say, first time on vinyl in 15 years, the promise ring something feel good, feels good, remastered from the original source tapes. Also, by the way, this is sold out and I'm pissed about it. <laughs> Another example is a table or, or a chart. Uh, charts can be tricky. This image actually shows data in it. And so the data needs to be integrated into the alternative text in some way. Uh, the best, uh, the, the easiest thing to do would be just to type out all of this text, but that's obviously gonna get incredibly long if you try to relay all of this information in, in, one, alternate, in one alt text field. So a lot of times in this case, what you'll do is you'll provide an alternative. Um, this is, they did not provide an alternative, so I just gave them one, which is a copy and pasted Wikipedia chart. But in this case, the alt text can be chart of the percentage of times an artist appears on a post-punk playlist, see following table for data. And then that table below is able to be uh, accessed through screen reader and, through, and by tabbing through the, the content. This is able to be read. You're not hiding the content within an image anymore. Um, sometimes you can host that information on a separate page or further down the page with an anchor. So in this case, it might be something like chart of the percentage of times an artist appears on a post-punk playlist and then a link to where that data is if you don't want to put it on the actual page. Um, either way, these are going to be rare. Uh, your best bet is to make sure that, that data like this is just actual content within the page, not, not trapped within an image. Uh, those are kind of edge examples, though, when you think about it. Let's get to the more common example, just a plain old ordinary image. Uh, no text, no data, just the image. Writing this kind of alternative text can land in a bit of a uh, blurry area because it depends solely on us interpreting the details required to make the image useful. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier. We're not tasked with describing the image itself. We're tasked with describing the information that image is attempting to portray. In some cases, that's easy. A plate of pancakes is a plate of pancakes. But in this case, um, it, it's, just, it's just sort of an abstract image. So what do you say? Do you say alt equals a bunch of boxes? Well, no, that's not helpful. You might as well have just not put the image in at that point. Or do you go the opposite direction and you say, uh, five columns of non-symmetrical boxes in, in between 10 and 12 boxes in each column with randomized colors, including green, blue, white, red, black, yellow, on a gray background. Yes, I did practice that. <laughs> no, because that's also ridiculous. And now this has to be read and it's way too long. Instead, we, and you're going to find this is a common theme throughout this talk, we land someplace in the middle. A grid of differently colored boxes illustrating order among chaos. Now we know what that image is there for. We understand the purpose of that. Uh, some final quick hints on writing alternative text. Uh, there's no need to write picture of or image of. This is already implied because it's alt text. Um, also, keep things short. Screen readers can actually cut off the text, and so make sure you keep it roughly around 100 or 125 characters. That's a guideline. That's not a law. Uh, use your best judgment. In this case here, uh, we. This alternative text is way too long, um, but there's no way to make it shorter because that text is in the image. In this case, the answer isn't make the alt text shorter. The answer to this one is make the slide better so that it actually can be you know, conveyed. Finally, make sure that your uh, Drupal install isn't allowing for file name fallbacks. Uh, if you don't know if it is, just make sure, like ask a developer and say, please don't do this because uh, what this means is that if, uh, if there's an image you'd rather have a blank alt tag, your system doesn't see that blank spot. It says, it says oh no, it can't be blank, man, because I read a blog post about it once, and then your Drupal install says, I'm just gonna put whatever I think should be in there. How about the file name? Digital art 1444990 underscore 640. <laughs> this is bad <laughs> in a lot of ways. 
you specifically wanted the alt tag in this case to be blank, and so you don't want the CMS like under the guise of helpfulness to jump in there and, and provide a fallback of, of, of that uh, of that image file. So uh, just make sure that that things are, are that that option is is available. And I'm sorry, wait, hold on. I just spent a bunch of time talking about how alt tags are necessary and you need to put text in them, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm talking about sometimes you can leave them blank. And yes, that is the troublesome part of alternative text, the exceptions. Um, this is literally, this was the longest part of this talk for a while. I had to cut a lot of stuff out. Um, this is really our first foray into the, it's the really gray area of inclusion, which can be a, a tricky line to balance. It's, it's not as easy as just blanketing every image with alternative text. Remember, the idea of alternative text is to create an experience that mirrors the visual experience. But in order to do that, we have to uh, understand how images and graphics are used on a website. So first off, we have to understand that not every image is necessary for the site itself. Some images are what we call decorative, some are structural. These are things that we roll right through when we're looking at a site with our, with our scanning eyes. We don't see them. They offer a level of graphic ambiance, but uh, they don't present any actual content. And therefore, uh, we don't encounter them outside of a, a general feeling. For example, there is structural content, um, which is, this is, this is my old blog. Uh, this is the design two designs ago, and I put little graphical flourishes in between all of the blog posts, and they don't need to be read by a screen reader, please. I don't want this to say graphical flourish every time my blog post ends. But we do still have to give it an alt tag. And so what we do is we give it an alt tag equals blank. And the reason we do that is because otherwise the screen reader is going to look at it and say, ah, there's something here, there's something here, and it's going to get really angry. This way it says, hey, there, we know, there's something here. Just don't read it. From an editor side of things, you probably won't have to worry about this too often. Um, these are things that should be built into the, uh, built into the template. Um, but then there's also images that are already nestled next to some identifying text. So examples of this include um, a directory that includes the name of the person next to their image, or uh, a caption on an image within a publication, or an icon that sits next to a heading. And the reason we don't need alt text on these goes back to the reason behind alternative text in general. It provides explanation for images that cannot be seen for whatever reason. In all of these cases, that text is there. It's just not, it's just not in the actual image. It's related to the image. In fact, if you were to read alternative text for the image and then also read the text itself, it starts to get really noisy. It's an added layer of noise. It ends up sounding like this. A red panda next to a bamboo tree, a red panda next to a bamboo tree. A red panda next to a bamboo tree, a red panda next to a bamboo tree, on and on until the world dies. <laughs> Finally, alternative text can be skipped uh, if the image provides no communication value outside of page decoration. And this, this, I'll be completely honest, another time uh, during this talk when my wife got into a large argument with me because this is ultimately an editorial issue. This is an, a matter of opinion and, and judgment. There are some that believe a university carousel slide uh, or a page hero of students uh, underneath trees, they con that conveys important information. It provides a feeling for campus life. It helps uh, students visualize themselves on campus. And there are others, and I find myself in this, uh, in this camp, that feel that while these are nice accent pieces, they they provide a way of breaking up the page for those who can see the page. They, are, they have little to no contextual value to the content on the page. So ultimately, what the answer to this is, I don't know, it depends. But thankfully, you don't have to make these decisions alone. There's the alternative text decision tree. Uh, thanks to the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, this describes how to use and when to use alternative text in various situations. So like, on the highest levels, it's gonna say, does the image contain text? And if you think the answer is yes or no, you're wrong, because the answer is actually yes, 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 or no. There are lots of different versions of what you would do with alternative text, depending on the type of text that, has, that is inside of that image. So uh, this is actually an incredibly useful tool. Um, I have a slide at the very end of this, and it'll be posted. All of the things I talk about, the tools, the, the links, the articles, um, and so um, you'll have that at the end, so don't worry, I'll, you'll have access to all of these tools. Um, 
And what you're going to find out with this is that a lot of times, and I find this out with a lot of new sites, especially if there's a lot of hero images uh, being used, especially with university sites, 90% um, of the images that we put up there don't need alt text. They're all purely decorative. They're there to provide some level of decoration. They don't provide context, a lot of context to the page. But if you were to put alt text in a lot of those heroes, it's still OK. So it, it ends up being a judgment call. All right, enough about alt text. Let's talk about transcriptions. Um, with captions and transcriptions, we shift in focus from uh, visual media toward audible media, but that's sort of a, a bit of a misnomer because uh, the idea that videos are uh, captioned and, and transcribed for the deaf or hard of hearing has kind of become an outdated thing. Uh, now videos are captioned uh, because you have your computer sound down or they're captioned because you're on the quiet car or they're captioned because the text itself is just easier to search and index uh, and because not everyone consumes information in the same way. Um, when it comes down to it, videos are no longer captioned just for a disability. They're captioned because having multiple options is always the best option. As Eileen Webb says in her talk, which I linked to in my notes, integrating accessibility, your video and audio content is not ready for the web until there are captions or a transcription. There's a difference between the two types, uh, and it largely depends on how you're using that video or audio and what you want to get out of it. Uh, captions are useful when the video is meant to be viewed in real time with the text, a, a live event, or something in which the video is closely tied to the audio. You know, a, a, a video on collegehumor.com that has lots of arm waving and physical motion along with the slapstick comedy, along with uh, the, 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 the actual words, is probably not going to do as well transcribed as it would with captions. Um, but in most other cases, videos, we find them, it's easier to transcribe them. Um, transcriptions separate the text from the audio, uh, and they provide what is essentially an article view uh, of the content. Uh, the benefits being, you know, the video is actually no longer the focus. The, the content is, the text is. You know, this obviously won't work for live events. Uh, it won't work for those, those examples earlier, the slapstick comedy or things like that. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's usually the best option. And it's not all about videos either. Uh, any medium that requires sound should have a transcription attached to it, uh, unless, again, it's leave, de dealing with live sound. So podcasts, uh, like Paul Ford and Rich Dad's Track Changes, which is a wonderful podcast, and also they do a great job on their blog of transcribing the entire uh, episode. Um, the full conversation is, is listed there, including background sounds. It's a great example of, of how to do podcast transcription correctly. Um, or even conference talks. Uh, you know, it's a no-brainer for me to transcribe the talks that I give uh, on my blog, especially if they've been taped. But even if it's not being videotaped, I make sure to post a transcript of it. It's just, you know, good content. That's not even an accessibility thing. That's just, I don't know why you wouldn't transcribe the things that you were talking about in public. Um, for both transcriptions and captions, uh, we used video service, a hosting service to, to do it. We let them do all the work, essentially. Uh, YouTube, you can upload a video to YouTube, and um, after about half an hour, it's there. And then what you start doing is you start typing it. And it's, it's actually fantastic because um, it allows you to, to type, 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 and it will pause the video while you're typing. Um, it still takes a while, and so uh, if you don't have the time or if you have like extra money and you just don't want to take the time, uh, you can easily outsource this stuff to uh, someone who can professionally transcribe it to you, uh, for you. Um, it's obviously going to take a little bit of cleaning up because you know no one's going to know your brand terms, nobody's going to know the people you're talking about. Nobody's going to be able to pick up all of the uh, accents or any sort of muddied voices in the same way that you would. Um, but it's going to save a lot of time uh, if, if, it's, if it's worth the, uh, the, the cost to you. Finally, um, we'll talk real quick about uh, one last thing in this section, and that is the title field, um, which ends up getting used in about 70 million ways, depending on how the site is, is set up. It can be the navigation title. It can be the title that's, that's pushed for search engines to pick up. It can be the title of an article. It can be the title of the piece of content itself within, within Drupal. All of these uses have one major thing in common. They all contribute to wayfinding, uh, especially for somebody who is using a screen reader to navigate content. The title field is important to accessibility because it is what is announced when a new page is loaded. You know, this is sort of your time to shine. This is what's an, this is your introduction to, to the page content. 
It should be concise, and it should be accurate, and it should be clear. The title field is not a time to like get wacky. Uh, it's a time to make things understandable. It's not a time to, to really push a lot of brand terms. It's a time to say this is exactly what's on the page. And so here's an example. This is actually from our site. Um, the basics are you give an informative title that is short but understandable. So this is our this is a page that it lists all of our employees at Blend Interactive, what we call our team. And so I don't know, we just called it our team. We don't have any other pages on the site called our team. This is clear. When you're navigating through, you understand what our team is. And then what we do is we um, we actually append the uh, name of our company at the end of it for all of our uh, all of our URLs. This is automatic. Um, we put it at the end, and I've seen a lot of organizations put it at the start, because I don't know, SEO or something. But what, that ends up, what ends up happening is as you're tabbing through things, when you hear this name when you go to the page, it starts with the company every single time. When you're going through your browser history, it starts with the name of your company every single time. Uh, you've actually lost an element of wayfinding in that case, because every one of the pages looks the same, especially if your company name is too long, and it pushes everything else out here, or if you've slapped a bunch of keywords in there. An example here is, um, this is a university site that we worked on. Um, it's the University of Sioux Falls, but for some reason I decided to hide the name of the university in the example, so just, I don't know why. Um, there's no yes or no answer for what the title should be. Unfortunately, like all of this editorial writing, there's really no, there's no, there's guides, but there's no rules. You can say degrees for this page, which Again, it's probably way too short. You probably, uh, the university probably has multiple pages that relate to degrees, and so this isn't even a differentiating title. Or you can go really long, and this is what this university had uh, before we jumped in there and, and tried to help them. Um, under uh, Undergraduate programs and majors, liberal arts college, University of Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yes, it did have Sioux Falls in there twice. This is, the reason they have this is because they want to show up in search engines for liberal arts college. They want to show up uh, for Sioux Falls. They want to show up for South Dakota. Ultimately, again, what it probably should be is something in the middle. Um, and we ended up changing this to undergraduate programs and majors, University of Sioux Falls. If this sounds a little bit like we're just straight up talking about writing, you're, you're right. So let's just go to the next section of the uh, presentation. When we talk about writing for accessibility, we're talking about writing for the web, which is uh, essentially a mix of copywriting in the traditional sense and, and uh, writing for a purpose designed to you know, make people make decisions and, and, um, and take action, and plain language, which is the art, and I mean that 100%, it is an art, of providing uh, access to people, to access for content access to content for people with a, with a wide variety of reading levels. Uh, to the Center for, print, for Plain Language, plain language means the target audience can read, understand, and confidently act on the information in your content, which means the definition of plain is a definition that shifts with the audience. What is plain language for one audience may not be plain language for another audience. Content that is specific to a biology teacher is going to reach a different level of plainness than content meant for their students. This takes a lot of work to figure out, and I'm afraid it takes a lot of time, not just time in that we will spend more time writing content, but time that we will spend years gradually trying to figure out how to get things more plain without losing the actual meaning of what we're trying to say. Until we get there, many years in the future, let's look through some rules to make things a little easier. First, uh, writing text so that it's scannable is, uh, is incredibly important to help people uh, better parse the information within a section. Uh, in this case, it's, we get this and it's like intimidating for anyone who doesn't have a, a really high reading level and it's, there's a lot of text in there. It's, just, it's got a lot of information just bursting from the seams, but it's, it also doesn't really say anything at all. It's like the sort of those weird, like middle of the rap Lin Manuel Miranda lines that just you threw in just because it rhymes. This text is daunting. It's inaccessible. It's 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 it's, it's an example of bad content design. So instead, con instead, content should be built in a way that's a bit more, uh, dare I say, airy and, and free. 
Um, you can see that there are different sections. There are subheadlines, bullet points. There's five things that we've done to make this content more accessible. We've made sure that there's a relevant headline instead of a cute headline. Because somebody who already has to navigate all of, uh, yeah, also it just says relevant headline. The people who have to navigate everything else on a site using assistive technology, they don't also have to try to figure out what you mean by your title. Uh, we're writing in shorter chunks of content, meaning we're making sure there's just one thought per, con per, per paragraph. So people can quickly understand what we're talking about. We're not hiding things within a, a big wall of text. Uh, we're using subheads that further break down uh, the body of content and to signify to the browser where content concepts are located. Uh, we're using bullet points to say, this is a list of things you should know about. And we're using clear and actionable, actionable links, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The positive to writing like this is that uh, by assigning headlines and properly labeling links and using fewer but, but more important words, we're doing two things. Uh, we're being deliberate with our language. We uh, are rem also remembering that search engines, just like assistive technology, rely on understanding the structure of the content. So while we write things to, to, to be read easier by, uh, by uh, the assistive technology, we're also writing things that are easier to understand for, for search engine optimization. Sometimes you're gonna get asked about reading levels, like I, we, had, we have a client right now um, that wants all of their, I, I, this sounds ridiculous, but it, I promise you it's true. They want all of their le legal documentation to be written at a fifth grade level. <laughs> so that's a thing we're working on. We're, when we're diving into the readability of words, we tend to wanna slink over to like automated tools to get those numbers. The reason for this is that writing is a really difficult task, and it's hard to know if you're doing it right. And so we hope that tests like the, like the Flush-Kincaid test readability scores will, will help us like, okay, well, at least we're getting closer. And that's really what they do. I mean, for example, this is a, a page from gov.uk about uh, bringing animals into the country. If we take this page and throw it into um, a, a readability tester, which I link in the notes, we can see it's been written at roughly an eighth to 10th grade level, uh, depending on the score that you're using. Even more visually, you can see that it's been designed in a way that's easy to read. There's lots of bullet points, uh, obvious uh, headings, uh, short, short paragraphs. This page from the CDC here in the United States has similar content. It's the same, it's the same concept. It's asking about how do you bring animals into the country. But it looks more complicated. It has headings and it's got some bullets, but the, there's more blocks of text. And according to the readability testing, it's roughly three grade levels higher, from 11th to 13th. Essentially, a college level is required to read this page. These are nice to know, but you know, in fact, reading scores are just that. They're scores, they're numbers. Uh, they can help you make a point, they can help you see if you're improving on things. They don't act accurately represent your content in the way that actual reading or testing will represent your content. Uh, there's still a need to make sure you're taking the things that you write for your site and testing them with actual people. To going to your audiences and say, hey, would you read this and see if this makes sense? Other people in the audience, uh, you know, ask teenagers who aren't connected with it to see if they understand it, not knowing your brand guidelines, not knowing the, the jargon of your industry. In fact, I rarely use reading level scores anymore uh, when I'm looking at content. Instead, I go to something even more basic, which is called Simple Writer. How many people are familiar with Simple Writer? Now everyone is. Simple Writer was created by Randall Munro of uh, XKCD fame. It's, uh, it's based on the concept of Up Goer 5, which was a cartoon that he uh, drew to explain the mechanical workings of Saturn V, the rocket that, that sent astronauts for the first lunar landing, uh, using only the top 1,000 words in the English language. So what it ends up doing is it ends up pointing out the words that you're using in your text that are above those thousand most used words in English language. It's not telling you to replace them. It's just saying, hey, here's a bunch of big words you're using. Maybe, I don't know, think about using something else. Um, I took a before and after from plainlanguage.gov, which is a wonderful site, a wonderful resource for, for learning about plain language. Um, and they had some examples in there. And one example was an application for federal assistance that they used for their training 
purposes. And you can see that like, you know, a third of the words are above that, that thousand word level. There's a lot of other writing issues here as well, um, but the, definitely the words are there. I mean, it, it's, got, uh, it's got passive uh, sentences in there. It's, it's not clear enough. All of the actions are referenced from the agency and not the actual user. Um, but then they also give an example of, uh, of what it would look like after you've written it using plain language. And it still uses some of those, some of those higher than thousand words, but it's written in such a better way. It's, it's focused. It uses words because it needs them, not because it's just kind of I don't know, filling space like, like we do on our first and second drafts of writing. It's not perfect, but I mean, those words in red are a lot less scary than the ones in the first example. And that sort of brings up a point, you know, sometimes you can't simplify to a perfect level. We can't always rely on tests or, or tools to make sure that our stuff is written perfectly to a, a reading level test because these tests don't understand our audiences. They don't understand our context, you know? Sometimes they don't even understand whether or not it needs to be in words or not. This is the code of federal regulations uh, for warnings on a vehicle that could roll over at high speeds. This is the rollover warning label that is underneath your, your, uh, your, your what do they call those things? The, thank you, wow. <laughs> this was written in 1987. According to our testing, it's roughly 10th to 12th grade level of reading score. I threw it in simple reader and like 50% of the words are, are above that thousand. Uh, but in this case, the solution wasn't to make the text more simple. It was just to say, like, I don't know, um, if this car might roll over, so wear your seatbelt. <laughs> and even the text itself is simpler. You know, it's a ninth grade level instead of a 12th grade level. Uh, one thing that we really need to work on, especially uh, those of us who consider ourselves native speakers of the English language, is that our language is filled with a lot of, like, one-time use words and this garbage that serves a really... Uh, incredibly specific use, uh, if they serve any use at all. Um, these words, jargon, uh, idioms, weird metaphors, they can be important if you're writing like a blog post and you want to add some sort of creative cachet to the longer articles or, or, or prose. But when we're writing informative content for actual site users, we just want who just like you know want to they want to find information or they want to buy shoes or they want to you know bring their dog into the country. We need to understand that the best words are always the clearest words. You know. Words that can be understood both by us and by uh, robot translators. I mean, I want to, idioms are the worst possible thing you can put in your text. I, I love this example because this is what, that's how the cookie crumbles. If you translate that into French, it's this, and I don't know French. But I do know that it isn't this. That's how icing on the cake is what I always say. <laughs> so don't use idioms. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, writing for humans to understand, and we've talked about the fields that they need to sort of keep track in order to make sure that web browsers can understand. Um, but that sort of blob in the WYSIWYG editor, uh, it's a bit of both, you know? You actually are creating titles within there, and that's the heading structure. And I wanna touch on heading structure here quick. Um, for those who don't know, headings in text are most often seen as section headlines and subheadlines. They identify what a specific section uh, in in the body copy is going to be. Um, in fact, we see it most oftenly, uh, most often, most oftenly, most often on uh, long form content. Uh, these are two blog posts that I have read, uh, written, and I write incredibly long blog posts, so I always have subheads in there. Um, your H1 is typically uh, the first level heading. It's gonna be your title. Um, and then you've got H2s and H3s to sort of filter things down. And the reason that we need to do this is because um, they provide a really deep level of understanding for web browsers to, 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 to structure and, and figure out what you actually wrote. I mean, we have to think back, think back to middle school, you know, where we all learned the basic construction of an essay, where introduction, uh, three supporting paragraphs, uh, the conclusion. And by constraining to these five sections, we learn how to move beyond those sections. We better understand how arguments are made. We, we learn... Uh, how to create subsections within our, within our text. We, use how to use we learn how to use language to, to stall a conclusion for just a little bit longer. Web browsers, RSS feeds, uh, search crawlers, accessibility tools, they don't learn that stuff. They just know the text that you give it. They don't know the context. They don't understand what's important and what's not within this. And so we have to tell them. And we have to tell them in a way 
that follows the same outlines that we might make if we're giving a, a giant thesis. So seeing how one heading and one chunk of content feeds into each other, you can begin to see how scannability is harmed when we don't use headings in the right order. You know, when headings are used as visual cues instead of, instead of structural cues, we start creating problems. We end up with out of order headings, you know? If we think that the H3 just looks better there, and so we slap an H3 in there, and we don't really like the H4 style, so we're just gonna do H5s from there on out. We have now just said, uh, I don't care anyone who isn't reading this with eyes. I don't care what order you read this in, because clearly we're gonna go from section one to section three to section five, and skip around. And a screen reader gets confused by that. And somebody who uses a screen reader, who expects H2 to be the list of all those headings, people will cycle through these headings. If you uh, use JAWS on, on a Microsoft machine, pressing the one will take you to the H1. Pressing two will cycle through the H2s. Uh, here's a uh, quick example. Uh, it isn't just within the body copy, so there's a mix of this. There's the body copy text, and then there's also all the blocks and things that you sort of throw in at the bottom uh, or, or in between. Um, in this case, your H1 is typically gonna be the title of your page. The only exception that I've ever really uh, uh, sort of allowed is if uh, the, the homepage of your site where the title might be the actual, your company's name or organization's name. Um, and then H2 is going to be all of your sort of sections within that body copy. But once you get into the blocks itself, those also should be H2s because while we see them as just blocks slotted in, really what they are is they are an extension of the body field. It's just we're providing structure for that, for that section. So these still need to be H2s. And that's one of the things that we see development-wise that, that really causes problems is people will create blocks that end up being H3s and H4s because that's what the style dictated. Uh, writing these headlines is gonna follow the same rules we talked about uh, with titles. Um, this is that same blog post from the now defunct but still very much live Contents Magazine. Um, on uh, how to create a content strategy methodology. I had four main second level headings on that. Uh, methodology, a definition, why methodologies matter. Methodologies are personal, great, so how do we do it? And in doing that, I was able to, I, I mean, I wrote things that weren't just, you know, methodology this, methodology that, although I did use the word methodology three times. Um, they were also creative enough that they didn't, that they weren't boring, but also, I, I had to really focus on making sure that people understood what this is, because not everybody understands the concept of creating a methodology. Uh, the way I usually write this, uh, just as a quick tip, is I do paragraph to outline. I write my entire blog post or my entire uh, chunk of content first, and then I assign headings based on where I see the breaks in, in ideas. Um, uh, the same thing a newspaper editor would do with headlines. Uh, you can also do it, especially if your content's really highly structured, you might create the outline first and then write, fill in from there. Um, either way, this shows you how headings are essentially an outline uh, on the page. The last part of this is uh, dis descriptive text links. Um, I'm not gonna get into this like idea of, of hey, uh, you shouldn't write, you shouldn't make your link say click here, or you shouldn't make your links say read more because we're just going to assume that we all know that, that that doesn't mean anything. But we have to understand that sometimes people, especially if they're, if they're filtering through a, a page using a screen reader, they will only hear the text. They're gonna cycle through to hear the text of those links. None of the contextual information around it. They're just looking for a specific link. So when someone tabs through, they might uh, hear something. Neil like Armstrong, this. link. Buzz Aldrin, link. Lunar module link. I know that when I click on Buzz Aldrin, I'm going to get Buzz Aldrin. That link has made a promise to me. This is what you are going to get when you click on me or when you interact with me. Sometimes though, and we see this a lot on, uh, in publications and, and blogs will do this sometimes, but I have seen it on, on product pages as well. We start to get cute with the way we are writing links. Um, this is an example, a specific article from The Ringer magazine. Uh, it looks like it has three links, but in reality it has 13 different links. What they're doing is they're attempting to show the idea of the link by linking to it. They're not even putting the actual information you need inside of this. And what this sounds like is... The link. Most link. Successful link. Genre link. I won't go through the whole thing. 
but the whole thing is up there in case we have 45 seconds to get through that one set of links. Ultimately, what this should have been, what, what those links are is they're links to different, um, different procedural dramas that have been popular over the years. When they could have just done something like this, so somebody who didn't want to click on the links could still understand what they're trying to say. You know, it's arguably, arguably, arguably the most successful genre. The history of American television is shown by classics like NYPD Blue, Law and Order, CSI, and NCIS. And then there's the opposite side of things, where if we are uh, writing this, I just pulled this off a of metaphor, just a fascinating story, but this is one link. And there's a lot of text there, and it's just the text of the tweet. A wee old woman came in and said, quote, I have a question. Why does page seven in all the books I take out have the seven underlined in? Again, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but <laughs> what the thread tells is the story of like this old library secret code. It's fascinating um, that people will use to track their books if, before there was, you know, computers, apparently. Um, and there's a whole thread there. And what I would have liked to have seen on a link on that is, you know, the full thread tells the story of what you're going to go read. Instead, I don't know what this is. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a, a, a thread. All these examples are taking users to text pages, and that's cool. But uh, text pages are text pages. Um, but what happens if we're linking to a PDF? What happens if we're linking to a video? Simply, uh, we just have to be honest again. Uh, you'll see this a lot. Uh, this will be added into certain websites. Uh, it's something that usually I don't think it comes st standard on Drupal at all. It's something that's developed into it, but. Uh, this idea that when you are going to uh, going off site, it will give you the little you're going off site link item or uh, PDF download will show you a little PDF icon and there's alt text attached to that icon so that when you read that link it says you know in this case Excel spreadsheet it would say Excel alt, the alt would be Excel download. Um, if you don't have the setup uh, currently, what you can do is actually just add it into the link itself. That's totally okay. Um, this is what we had to do for a few clients where we were helping them fix their, the, uh, the editorial accessibility on things, but we, they didn't have the budget to do a giant overhaul of, of some of the conventions. So, uh, you know, external resources, new window. Well, I know, what that's, I know what's gonna happen. There's a promise made there, and I know that promise will be kept. Uh, student body profile, PDF. Okay, I'm gonna use the rest of this time to talk about change um, and uh, the accessible environment, because at the root of Nearly every web problem is the uh, idea of change. Uh, change in how we handle things internally, uh, change in how we work through problems, change from what we were taught or, or what we were assumed. Uh, ultimately, in order for accessibility work to be handled in your editing process, it has to become something that is a priority company-wide. Uh, in almost every sense, updating and creating content for accessibility is an issue of time. You know, it takes extra time to review content. It takes extra time to think about somebody beyond your own mind. It takes time, and so time needs to be allocated. Which can be a tricky thing to bring up. In essence, asking for better support for editorial accessibility, it means asking for more budget. It means asking for more attention. It means it's asking someone to, to, to take this on their shoulders and champion not just the obvious examples, but, but, but everyone who comes in contact with your site, not just enough to pass tests, but enough to provide a true positive user experience. And it doesn't help that accessibility is a lightning rod. Nobody wants to admit that they've made a mistake and willingly or unwillingly excluded someone be through, through non-inclusive design. So I guarantee there will be a tendency to get defensive on those, on those mistakes. I look back on some of the first projects I've ever worked on. And it's not the spelling errors or, or the bad strategy decisions that I made. I'm most embarrassed by the fact that I have things that was so self-centered in my worldview that I, I unwillingly included non-inclusive language and design in sites that I helped build. But that's the past. We can't worry about those mistakes. We have to fix them and make them better. And we have to worry about the mistakes that could come in the future. We have to protect ourselves against those. You know, there's nothing we can do to fix the past, so we have to start walking toward the present and beyond. So when non-accessible content or writing comes across your desk, just help make it better. You know, explain why it matters. Don't get mad or, or haughty, just help everyone get better. You know, even if through sheer repetition, 
and will, this is something that will get fixed. We can start by doing things that feel really commonplace, you know, and from there we, we build uh, things into our workflow. We implement a checklist. If your organization has a checklist of like, these are the three things you need to do before you post this content, one of those things should be make sure this is accessible. And then run it by somebody, even if you don't have questions, even if you think you've nailed it, ask someone else to take a look at it as well, even if it's just a quick read, you know? Make sure you get second opinions on things to make sure that more minds are solving the problem. Part of this process is also making sure that it has a champion, like an accessibility uh, guru or ninja or whatever LinkedIn terms we are using these days. Uh, someone who's responsible for the main details. You know, even if you train everyone, that group, if, unless you're doing it every day, they're gonna forget and they're not gonna pay attention to stuff. So you have to have somebody whose job it is to take care of that stuff. Part of that is making sure that that person is stayed, it stays up to date, that you're supporting that person, not just by saying, hey, you know, you're our accessibility person, cool. Send them to training, make sure that they have time to continue learning new technologies. All right, there's so much more. Accessibility is not a thing that you can tackle in an hour. They've already clapped over there, I'm sorry. <laughs> in a day or even like over the time, like, things are gonna continuously change and update. Even if you could learn it all in an hour, it probably would be changed in, in a few weeks. Uh, all you can do is just get better and better at what you do and, and what you need to do. And, but understand that nothing can be perfect. So I've referenced a lot of tools in this talk. I will put a slide up at the end that has all of those tools in it. Um, but I want you to come away with three things uh, from this talk. First, I want you to understand uh, the reach of accessibility. Um, that it's not just for people who, who are blind and deaf, but anybody who is in an environment that might differ from yours. Uh, someone who's just learning English, someone who has a broken arm, somebody living in poverty with a, with a slow broadband connection. I want you to see that really accessibility is all about options. You know, it's about understanding that providing both a video and a transcript adds a benefit, that, that images aren't the only way to convey understanding, that we need multiple ways into our content, just like we need multiple ways into buildings for different ability types. And I want you to understand that the most accessible content is clear and concise. It can be translated better. It can be understood by multiple uh, reading levels. It can be, uh, it's, just, it's just easier to, to, to take care of. I'm sorry, I'll throw a fourth one in too. Uh, be okay with gray areas. You know, accessibility isn't a checkbox. It's not a binary issue and that's really hard. Uh, when we learn to write, we learn rules. We learn rules in writing because knowing the basics is important. It's what helps us shape language, but the basics can't solve every problem. Creativity and judgment are needed to make decisions, to take chances. And while we don't often see web writing as a place where chances are taken, we have to understand that there is a balance to what we do. There are the rules, and then there is the interpretation of those rules. You know, and that interpretation, frankly, scares the shit out of a lot of people. It, it doesn't have to be hard. All we need to understand is that the gray areas are only gray areas to those of us living without disabilities. Someone who can't see, there's no gray area. They know exactly what works and what doesn't. Someone with a broken arm knows exactly why it's difficult to key through a site. And someone who grew up in another country understands exactly why the complicated instructions on their insurance company's website are difficult to translate. We're afraid to be wrong, but we don't have to be. For years, the bare minimum was enough, but not anymore. Instead, we need to put ourselves into the minds of those who will be encountering our content and say that uh, the bare minimum isn't enough anymore. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better. So thank you so much, uh, and let's get out there and make better websites. That's the link right there. Uh, eatingelephant.com is my content strategy blog. Drupal 18, the DrupalCon 18 is the link. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know I didn't leave any room for questions because, haha, -ha, no. Uh, if you have questions, just come talk to me after this. And thank you very much. Okay, I'm over here.
Oh, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you didn't talk about long descriptions. Yeah, I know. I do in my workshop. <laughs> it's so hard. That's something that we're struggling with. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I've read a little bit about that in terms of making it like having a link to another page. Mm -hmm. But are there other best practices for that? Like I'll be honest. We're we're doing the link to another page thing a lot. Um, what we've been doing is um, creating almost like a glossary page for stuff like that. And so the long description might just be like, if you don't fully understand this concept from this image, here's the glossary of all of our data. Yep, and then yep, you include, include a link to it and it says for more information or for the data. Yeah, well, and it's, yeah, it's like a giant long page and, um, and it just has anchor links on it. And so you just click on that, it goes to that anchor and it brings you right to where you need to be. That table? I just, I just, I just dropped the table. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, so in, in the talk, in the alt, what you're doing is you're just saying, hey, um, there's no. This is a table. If you want the data, go below, or go like the table. The table is going to follow. We're not. The table is not in the alt. The table is on the site. Yeah, the table is on the site itself. Yeah, yeah. We never put the table in the alt. Tech. Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, no, you don't. You don't do that. I'm glad you brought that up because I'll need to make that clear. It's already weird enough. I just slapped a table in there from a completely different page. <laughs> slides are up there. Yep, everything. Everything's up there. Slides, links to books, stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you know the best, it, like, uh, I, I would say uh, that there are two books that I think are wonderful at that, and they both do everything. The one I mentioned, the Pickering's uh, thesis design pattern, is great for your design skills, because it goes, there's a lot of stuff that talks about it, and it's like, it's very similar. And then uh, a book of art has one called um, Tiffany and Everyone, I think it is, and that, that also goes into uh, a good chunk. Uh, those are li links to those books in there. Uh, should have just uh, Amazon for Amazon. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. I do sometimes. We actually do a conference in Seattle, <laughs> um, and this is a workshop, like a four-hour right, workshop. Right. And then, um, as far as other conferences, I'm not doing any other ones this year. But I have contact. Oh, oh yes. The, okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Like two years, I had to make some up. There you go. Yeah, thank you, Bernie. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. I'm gonna come down here because this is really weird to be up here. Was it like a, for like developers? Or? It's like some of everything. It's like uh, in, in a different context. It's like when you make a content type and it has all those different things, how are they supposed to know what to put in the fields? And like, but like, and okay, so there's help text there, but how do you decide what to put in the help text? And like, so there's this thing that happens that when you read it, it's an entire transcript of our Like, 
she, she loved it, of course, but yeah. uh, any other things you're looking at? Joanna and I are flying to Poland for a hotel in like three hours. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, so Michael and I might go to the Yeah, exactly. Because that's very direct. I grew up in the country. 
Oh, okay. Everything. It's not like anyone, it's not like the conversation wasn't done. I don't know. Right? It's not like it'll be done. It's like we bought and all the I like it. Honestly, you know how you have kids now. They'll, they'll just steal your kids and they'll, uh, they'll work at Nike. Like, well, we think about all this stuff well, about they have that the we're at like the place where you put the kids and you get the other stuff. And like the question of how you do gender identity is all tech. So that's what I wanted to talk about that too. It's like you just want to talk about it. Well, sorry. This is the same thing we've been talking about where we're like, you probably didn't have to people like this. Like, is it yeah. relevant to yeah. say they all have that the idea? Right, or like, is it inappropriate to say, like, you, you need to identify with them? Yeah. All the people, yeah. well, exactly, yeah. because they want the parents yeah. to be able to go. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Pictures yeah. are often like, you know, they're like, somebody who looks, looks yeah. queer yeah. and they're so, anti-black so and like yeah. a woman, and like, it's just yeah. 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 And then because they're trying to show diversity, and that's visual information. Yeah, there is information about the culture of the team. The thing that I love about what he said, he's presentation. Is it jives with all of my instincts because I was trained as a writer. I know. I know. So, I know. so I know. I've that's been this whole time. I'm like, this really seems like editorial, like a bit area. Yeah. And I rewrite links and like me. I. And, but I everyone's like, no, so you don't. Just just what? No, it's science. And I'm like, but, but like that was just very affirming to me. So I was like, yes, this is a writing. I know this. I don't know. I really like the concept that like it's only the much of which we get to see it in the writing. Yes, the greatness is a function of privilege. Because exactly. on the other side of it, it's black or it's white. It's, it's, like, it's working for it's not working. Like there's an appropriate uh, level of leadership for our audience. And like, that's all it is. Well, I mean, there could still be like. Very well, sorry, I'm going to just. No, no. Very nice to not meet you. Very nice to not meet you. Please resume the conversation. Oh, high five. High five, New England. Woo! I'll see you at the DrupalCon at one ish. Oh, I have never heard that, but. Uh, I mean, I have been waiting to talk to him. So I'm not just standing here. I know. Basically, taking. You're multitasking, is what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Killing two invasive species of birds with one stone. That's. 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 How I like to use that. Animal lover, but like also conservationist. You're like, well, okay, if we're gonna kill birds, because we have to use this analogy, this idiom. Isn't there that whole thing about like is in New Zealand? So in Australia, possums are a protected species because they're like their habitats or whatever. But they're not native to New Zealand, and because they're not native there, they have no predators there because they're natively there are no mammals. You can take all those PDFs and you can. And facts so are awesome. Facts are awesome. So there's no predators for anything like possums. So in New Zealand, I feel like I keep feeling wild possums are a Yeah, I feel like they get like contractual development turned into that, which is essentially an ethical. Yeah, because you do the same things. It's like you give it. Which is really interesting because I have I have very little context for it. Although it seems like raised rabbits for me, and that's what they make their fur into. So I'm like, but like. That so it goes through like question, it goes through your PDF, goes to sex and I it finds things that it knows but, um, we take them for this yeah. Like images, that and all text, it like it'll check your headings. Oh, like okay. if you just have oh, oh, is this a heading or is it just whole text? Yeah, like that. And they do it like a for like scan documents. I don't do anything with really you have to like hide those. Yeah, we don't have all the time. It's just guessing now, you know, that's the problem. It just it it makes me feel better that it's like a quick Right, exactly. Like like I have done it out of necessity and then it's also like it's hard to do it's hard. Like it's physically difficult work to do very well because I just don't have Right, because a lot so of just make it's one of those things where I'm like, I will just like absolutely make them pay you for this, like, a lot of times the forms what doesn't seem like skilled labor to do it on a government level, like, they have to very difficult to do well, so. And that's what I try to do. My dogs got a hold of a wood It shouldn't be a PDF. It's just not sustainable. Yeah, and I was looking at a PDF. And I couldn't just well, that's have where, it. That's where we, you know, for us, it's a lot of like you know, suffering, right? So um, I was really afraid of it, like still being alive. I was pretty sure it was dead. So right. I was like, I don't have to worry about this. But if I did, I was like, I don't know how I would, yeah, be able to like put it out of its misery because it's, it's like a large yeah. animal yeah. and it's yeah. got like because thick skin cool. and it's like, yeah. I don't know. yeah, well, and they're like they're real fluffy. <laughs> they are pretty fuzzy. They, mm -hmm. It was Less a little gross with like the like, teeth yeah. and the claws. They're, they're, they're cute when they're far away. Yeah, they're definitely cute. The aesthetic <laughs> HTML pages that are, that are maybe 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was yeah, it's, I mean, it's a funny thing. It's like we document. We are we're so from pages and pages like just that's wild, like well, nature that people with most people just don't have any, any skills at all in that, in that space. And it's like you don't need them into sure. this. Okay. And now yeah. and the thing is exactly. Like they push the cloud. And then I'm like, it was the one time that I was like, maybe I should have a gun. Like, I know I'm a liberal hippie. I can't have that. But I was like, no, no, no. This is why I'm, I'm the person like a wheel gun. Yeah. yeah. Gun, you know, use a gun. But, um, Whatever the med. Because I don't know where else to so go. But it's like, I mean, I think that's your point too, right? It's like a lack of people and yeah. say, um, but it's exactly for things like that. And it's like, I, I like it like you're being sort of informed. Yeah. And, and, and if it has to be a gun, then just make sure it's not a liberal or hippie or whatever. I'm like, I own a Well, that's what it's under my bed. Or like the bullets are in my bedside table. Like, yes. Like, um, I have. And guns are like terrible. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But I mean, they, they, they I, I guess because from like New Hampshire's perspective is that you don't really have a